What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. You gotta think three now. You gotta think three. Three. Took it out for Gruntel. Gruntel has Time out. Time out. Ooh, did they foul? They might have gotten a foul here, too. I believe they did. And Gruntel, Stanford, don't go anywhere yet. Maybe there is a little magic left. Gruntel rattles it in. How do you like this? How do you like Lost the handle. It's picked up by Lonnie. Loose ball. Diving for the ball. Lonnie gets it to Robinson. You got three seconds. Lonnie's got to take a shot. He fires it up. He got it. And he like it. Can you believe it? Cardinal wins. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And this is going to be an amazing episode. I have Dan Grunfeld. Uh, he wrote By the Grace of the Game. I'm going to introduce Dan formally in a second. But Dan, I always like to mention past guests that people should check out on Inspired Insider. So I had um, Moise Navone of Mobileye, uh, one of the founding engineers. If anyone's heard of Mobileye, it was acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. But what's interesting about this story is he talked about the sacrifice and it wasn't always like that. And he had to go back to his family, tell his kids and wife that he was pulling them out of extracurricular activities. They were no more eating out during this journey. So it wasn't all like sunshine and rainbows. Check that out. Um, Yuri Adoni, the unstoppable startup, mastering Israel's secret rules of chutzpah. He spent 20 years in high tech, over 12 years of being a partner at Jerusalem Venture Partners. Amazing episode. Elon Gold, one of the, I don't know, Dan, if you've heard of Elon Gold, one of the funniest comedians um, he's been on Curb Your Enthusiasm, many TV shows. He's got Elon and Israelis, Elon Gold's commercial for Judaism, one of my favorite bits on the James Corden show. Check it out. And Paul Bigum has helped raise over a billion dollars for the state of Israel through direct mail. Uh, and so check that out, many more. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Dan, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking for ways to give to my best relationships. And I have found no better way to do that over the past decade than to profile the people, the companies and the books that I love and admire. And it's actually, I started podcasting partly because, which is going to relate to this episode, because of my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And they were the only members of their family to survive. But what lives on is his legacy. And Dan's going to talk about the legacy of his family through the book, but you could watch the interview of my grandfather that the Holocaust Foundation did on my about page on my website. And his, my kids, my grandkids, and my great grandkids will be able to watch that interview. So I see this as leaving a legacy. So um, if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com and learn more. Um, without further ado, Dan, Dan Grunfeld is a former professional basketball player, a graduate of Stanford University, where he was an academic All-American All-Conference basketball player. He played professionally for eight seasons in top leagues around the world, including Germany, Spain, and Israel. And like I said, he's the author of By the Grace of the Game and the Holocaust, a basketball legacy, and an unprecedented American dream. And it's all about, the, we're going to dig into it, the grips of Nazis to the top of Olympic podiums, to the cheap seats, to Madison Square Garden, and to yellow stars and silver spoons. So I, you know, Dan, I, I listened to this book. I devoured it. Um, it's a true masterpiece. Anyone listening to this, you. if you are listening to this, it should be made into a movie. I, I'm shocked that um, all of this is, you know, you see one of those movies and it says based on a true story, and maybe like 5% of it is, is true. And this one, it'll be like 99% of it is true. Um, <laughs> And uh, I know you currently work in venture capital with Lightspeed Venture Partners that they have over 400 investments since 1999. So Dan, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, great to be here with you, man. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I wanted to start off with, um, you know, on this journey um, with your grandmother, who I think yeah. you call Anyu, right? Anyu, that's um, right. Talk about Anyu and, and throughout this book, you did a lot of interviews to um, complete this book and what was one that stuck out with her and the Holocaust? 
Yeah, absolutely. So Anyu, my grandmother, and Anyu means mother in Hungarian. You know, my dad and my grandmother, native language is Hungarian. So my dad calls his mom Anyu. I grew up calling her Anyu, and that's what she's called to this day. And she's 96 years old. She lives in the Bay Area, 25 minutes from me and my wife, doing incredibly well. And yeah, she, she's a survivor, you know, and she lost five siblings and two parents in the Holocaust. And so I did a year and a half of research for this book, like you said, and I asked every question I could think of, you know, wanting to get the details of her experience, what happened to her siblings, to her parents. And there were so many deep moments and there was really painful moments, you know, because she was saved twice in Budapest by Swedish diplomat Raul Wallenberg, you know, is one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust. She saw very difficult things, went through difficult things. The one detail that really sticks out to me from the interview process is something she told me about beauty she saw during this process. And I write about it in the book where, you know, she was hiding in a basement and there was, you know, a lot of, you know, Jewish people who were fighting for their lives hiding. And one night they heard blasts, which they thought were bombs, but someone quickly went outside and saw that it was like fireworks. And she said that it was, you know, everyone got out of their hiding places, went outside and saw these beautiful big golden fireworks kind of light up the sky. And I just remember her telling me how she looked around and kind of, you know, in people's eyes, you know, it, it came back to them that life was worth living and there was beauty and, and all these things. And what that was, she would learn later is that the, the allies were lighting up the sky for bombing raids, you know, so bombs quickly started to fall and they went back underground. But there was something about that moment, you know, after hearing about all these hardships, and then hearing about this moment of real beauty during that time that I just thought was really poignant. You know, Dan, she risked her life several times also. And you mentioned uh, Earl Wallenberg and talk about that and, and what your, your grandmother did. So Raul Wallenberg, as I said, saved her life twice. And so the first way was he issued protective passports in Budapest to Jews. They were called Schutz passes. And so my grandmother got one for herself. And she risked her life, like you said, to obtain 17 others, you know, for, for people who needed help. So I always tell people, my grandmother is my hero, but she is also a hero. And, you know, so she had this protective passport. It gave her some security for some time. After a government change, it was no longer recognized. And she was captured by the Nazis. She was placed in the Budapest ghetto. And at the end of the war, she was in a ghetto with her brother. Uh, at the end of the war, Nazis came in with machine guns and word quickly spread that they were going to kill the remaining 80,000 people in the ghetto. And so my grandmother and her brother raced up to an attic. They hid in there. My grandma still talks about this. There's room for about four or five people. And there was like 12 of them packed in there, right? Because you know, their lives are at stake. And they waited for five minutes and then 20 minutes and then an hour and nothing happened. They eventually went out to check and the ghetto was clear. A Romanian Russian soldiers liberated them and my grandmother went home and that's how she survived. And that was 1945. In 1985, a movie came out about Wallenberg's life. And it was in that movie that my grandma saw that it was Wallenberg who raced to the gates of the ghetto, pleaded with the commanders and the guards to call off the massacre. You know, he said, you'll hang for this. You'll be a criminal for this. And so it took her 40 years to learn that Wallenberg saved her life twice during the war. Hmm. Who um, survived from her family and who did not survive? Both of her parents were killed in Auschwitz. She was, there were 10 siblings total. She was one of 10. And so mm. three of them were killed in Auschwitz. One was killed in a, in a camp in the Ukraine. One was killed on a death march in Budapest. So she lost five siblings and including her five survived. Did she talk about it all in the interviews, um, her mindset, you know, to survive? Because there's not a lot of hope when you see all this going on. Yeah. And, you know, it's amazing. She was 17, 18 years old. Right. So just just a young woman. But she, she does talk about it. You know, she talks about the discipline, you know, and, and you couldn't you couldn't be casual about anything. You know, your life was at stake with every, everything you did. And so she was extraordinarily disciplined. She maintained that hope and positivity. You know, she always talks about her father, you know, my great grandfather and what a great role model he was and how he raised her. By the way, my great grandfather's name was Solomon. My son is named Solomon after him. You know, so he's a very formative figure in our family. But just kind of the values of keeping faith and and you know having hope and you know that that's kind of what she applied. And what she also says, which I think speaks to her wisdom, is you needed luck. She'll say, "Hey, I did everything I could, but you know you needed luck because there was no stopping what was what was happening back then." And so there were people. She'll say there were people who did exactly the things that I did. 
and they were killed, you know, which is so sad and tragic. So she'll she'll comment on what she tried to do to survive, but with the perspective of so much of it was still out of her hands. Mm. And there's um, a really amazing story about how your grandparents got money. Um, <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, this is after. So my grandfather, by the way, he lost everyone in the war, you know, si both sisters, parents, everyone. So he came home with nobody. And so my grandparents, people have asked me because the book is out uh, when my grandparents met after both surviving the Holocaust. And I answer that truthfully. They met the day my grandmother got back. You know, she didn't have clothes. All she had was the thin cotton dress and overcoat that she'd been wearing in Budapest. And so her brother had been liberated months prior from a labor camp. And he said, come on, my friend who I met in the labor camp opened a store nearby when he got home. Let's get you some clothes. And it was that day that my grandma walked mm. through my grandfather's doors. And so where was Mary that located? Yep, that's in, in Transylvania. So on the border of Romania you. and Hungary. So my grandmother is from a little village called Mikola. My grandfather lived in the big in the biggest city next to it called Sutmar. And that's where my uh my dad was born. Mm. So and, you're uh, so her brother brought your mom to to his store. Day she got home. Yep. And got her clothes. And you know, they met and uh you know, they they've been together ever since. And at, my grandma always says, like, after the war, after that that much loss you the repair was the repair that was needed was so profound that people started families really quickly and so my grandparents did that you know had my uncle quickly had my dad eight years later and they lived under communism in romania so to your question about the money you know listen the communism nothing can compare to the holocaust but communism wasn't easy you know it was a very difficult life and in order to live you had to transact on the black market you know it's the only way to have any type of life and my grandfather did that and so they were able to save a thousand dollars worth of Romanian money and four thousand American dollars, which were highly illegal. They had friends who were jailed, tortured, or killed for having money. Uh, but my grandparents had chutzpah, right? I mean, they they survived the war, and so they got when when they were eventually able to leave Romania, they fled as refugees. So they weren't allowed to take anything of value out of the country. But my I, my grandma still talks about this. My grandparents looking at each other and saying. We have to get our money out. You know, we worked too too long and too hard, and so, and they did every cent of their name. So for the Romanian money, my grandfather found out which train was taking them out of Romania to Serbia and then to Rome. Uh, in the I middle mean, Dan, of the night, if this isn't a movie, I don't know what is. You know what I mean? So this, yeah, this, this is a this is a type of movie scene. Uh, my my grandpa, the middle of the night before they left, with a friend stand you know, watching. So he walked with him and watched, walked to the train station, forced his way on board the train. He had the Romanian money in his pocket. He found a seat at the front. He wedged it deep under the seat, left, you know, left the train, went home. No one saw a thing. So the next day when they got to the train station, the communists searched them. They patted them down. They got in my grandma's face and said, do you have any money? Are you carrying anything? She said, I'm not carrying any money. And she wasn't lying. It just was already on board. You know, so they got on the train. They went to Rome. My grandfather hung back when they were disembarking, got the money and was on his way. So that was the Romanian money. The American money was more of it and much more dangerous. And so this is really the wild one. Right. And because I grew up hearing this story. And then when I was writing the book, I was like, geez, this is this is just incredible. This is worlds colliding. And so my grandmother had a cousin who were who was also a Holocaust survivor. And he was in Budapest and he worked on, he was a production assistant working on movie sets. And there was an American movie being shot in Budapest. And the star of the movie was Buddy Hackett, who's one of the greatest American comedians. He had been on The Tonight Show 80 some times at that point. And my grandma, my grandparents said, well, wait a second. If Buddy Hackett would take our money out, you know, no one's going to stop him. And so my, uh, my grandparents approached my cousin. He asked Buddy Hackett and Buddy Hackett didn't hesitate. He said, if you can give me the money, I will take it out from you for you. And so, you know, that's a whole other story. My grandma had to sew a false bottom into a suitcase and they had to transport the money, which was dangerous. They got it into Buddy Hackett's hands. He brought it to the United States. He sent it to my great uncle in the Bronx. And when my family got to America, that was the money that was waiting for them. And there was an extra $50 on top, which is like more than a thousand today. And there was a note, handwritten note that said, good luck in America. Sincerely, mm. Buddy Hackett. Wow. And that comes so, full circle, right? Yeah, it, it, it does. Because, you know, 20 years later, when, you know, my grandparents had made good in America, my dad was this big basketball star. They were vacationing in Las Vegas and they saw Buddy Hackett perform. And after the show, 
uh, they were, my grandmother was telling the story about what happened. And one of her friends got up from the table, went to the front desk. Somehow he talked his way into Buddy Hackett's suite and he told him, those Holocaust survivors you helped, they're here. And he mentioned my dad and Buddy Hackett knew my dad because my dad was a player for the Knicks, you know, and Buddy Hackett's a Jew from New York. And uh, Buddy Hackett said, bring him up. I need to see him. And so they, came, they went up to Buddy Hackett's suite. They had some liquor together. They reminisced. And so it was really coming full circle. Dan, I want to talk about, you know, again, they were stripped of everything. Um, and there was one thing that your grandmother actually brought back. Yes. So you mean from, from her hometown? Yeah, actually, from her hometown. The war. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. So after my grandmother survived the Holocaust, she got home and her house was empty. I mean, this is, they had a, a, had a family of 10 children, parents, loving, loud home, empty. And it was looted. So there was, there was nothing left. And, you know, my grandma was disoriented and she was looking around and she found kind of wedged in the back of one of the drawers in the kitchen, an old metallic spoon. And, you know, they were a kosher family and it was a spoon my great grandmother used to ladle milk. And that was all that was left, you know, and my grandmother took the spoon, held it to her heart. And she took that, you know, with her, you know, un had it under communism, took it to the States and she gave it to me a few years ago. So now I have it. And, you know, I write in the book, I keep it very close to where I sleep. It, I keep it in my bedside drawer. And so think about a happy life with a beautiful family of 10 children. And that spoon, you know, was the only physical item that was really left. Yeah. And they came to the States and it's amazing what they did um, as entrepreneurs, right? And talk about what they created with the, with the shop. Yeah. And I learned so much from my grandparents and my dad did too. You know, it informed our basketball career so much, my professional career, because my grandparents came to the United States. They didn't speak English. They weren't formally educated. You know, and my grandmother loved to learn. She always says that, but because of the Holocaust, she wasn't able to go to school. Uh, when they got here, you know, I mentioned my uncle who was eight years older than my dad. And by the way, my dad called my uncle a name in Hungarian that in English translates to my king. That's how much he loved his brother. So my uncle was diagnosed with leukemia when they got to the United States and he passed away within a year. And so this is probably the biggest tragedy in the history of my family, certainly from my, my dad losing his older brother, from my grandparents, to, after losing family in the Holocaust to lose a son, you know, it, it, you, can't, you can't even express, you know, how, how deep that wound is. And so they dealt with so much, but through hard work, they were able to build a life. And so, yeah, they opened up a, after, you know, working some odd jobs, saving up some money, the Buddy Hackett money helped. They were able to open up a fabric store in the Bronx and they worked maniacally. You know, they, they just worked. They treated people the right way. Uh, my grandmother, you know, she spoke several languages, but she picked up a couple more languages to communicate with the clientele. I mean, they did everything they needed to do to build a business because what that meant was to build a life. You know, and so my grandfather worked seven days a week. My grandmother worked six days a week. It was both of them, you know, working in the store. They'd make my dad come on weekends, which he really disliked. But they built a really nice life for themselves in the United States. And again, didn't speak the language, weren't educated, lost a son. And so if they can do it, you know, there, there's really hope for everyone because it's, it's really remarkable what they built. Dan, there's one point where they don't make your dad come back to work. I mean, you need all hands on deck, right? With this type of business. Yes. Um, but there's one point where they said, you know what? Don't worry about coming back to work. Yeah. And so, you know, for my dad coming to America as you know, an immigrant, he also didn't speak the language. He had lost his brother. He, he went to the playground in New York City to make friends, learn English and to heal from that loss. He started playing basketball, you know? And, and he always says, well, that's the way you made friends in the neighborhood, right? The better you were at hoops, the more friends you had. And I could say to him, well, you must've made a lot of friends because, you know, he had never touched a basketball before coming to New York. And then he, he just, it clicked, you know, it just happened for him. But my grandparents never saw him play basketball. They were so busy at the store. And my grandfather was a world ranked ping pong player and a semi-professional soccer player. He was a great athlete, but he just, they didn't know what was happening. And so they got a call at their store one day when my dad was a junior in high school already. And it was his high school basketball coach. He said, hey, you have to see this kid play basketball. And they had never been to a game because the games were in the afternoon and they would have had to close the store, which they never would do. And so the next week they closed the store early. They went to a game, but not too early. You know, they couldn't lose too much business. And when they got there, the gym was closed. 
you know, and the, and the usher at the door said, Jim's closed and it's full. We can't let you in. And my grandfather, his English was not very good. He said, you know, we're parents of player, we're guests of coach. And the usher said, nothing we can do. And my grandma said, our son is Ernie Grunfeld. And the, the usher's eyes light up. He said, why didn't you say so? You know, let him in the gym. And uh, my grandma still tells a story that, you know, they looked around the gym and my grandpa kind of nudged her arm and in Hungarian said, well, if Ernie's so good, why isn't he on the floor? And my grandma pointed right to the middle of the floor and said, look right there, that's Ernie. My grandfather couldn't recognize my dad. He literally had transformed before his very eyes. And so to your question, it was after that game on the court where my grandpa said, you never come to the store to work again. You know, because you, he, he, he saw something special was happening even after that first game. He said, you work on your basketball, we'll take care of the rest. And one of my favorite parts of the book, I don't, I don't know why, maybe because I could visualize it in the movie is where your dad basically tells someone to pick on someone his own size. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, yeah. So, and my, you know, my dad was, was picked on when he came to America, you know, and, and that's one of the parts of the research that was really kind of powerful. Cause I, I knew that, you know, and listen, my dad is six foot six. He's a massive guy. He's, an Olympic gold medalist. Like he's a very well-known, successful guy. He was picked on as an immigrant in New York, you know? And so he, and so I asked him, what did they do? You know? And he said, well, I remember kids used to tell me to cross the street and I would do it because, you know, they point and I would do it. And then I would look back and they would laugh at me and walk away. You know, he, so he, it was hard for him in, in New York city. And so when he was kind of finding basketball at the park, he was playing with some friends against an older kid. And, uh, you know, this kid was from the neighborhood and they're kind of a scuffle broke out. And my dad was by far the biggest of his friends. So, you know, my dad tried to defend his friends and, you know, these high school kids, you know, one of them in particular put threw my dad on the ground, grabbed his head and slammed his head into the concrete over and over again. And my dad never forgot that even to this day, he didn't forget it, but certainly as he developed and then, you know, fast forward, you know, maybe five years, he's now the best player in the neighborhood one of the best players in the city. And that same person came back from college to play. I'll let people read the book yeah. to find out what happened next. But let's You just have say, to read the book to find out. My dad but, got um, the last laugh. <laughs> yeah. You got to read the book to, to hear about retribution. That's it. Um, you know, so let's talk about your dad for a second. And um, why Tennessee? Yeah. So back then, you know, the Big East wasn't the conference that it would become. And really, the, the great players out of New York City, they went down south to the SEC. You know, it was called the Pipeline to the South. So very common thing to do. You know, my dad's final two choices were Syracuse and Tennessee. And he was one of the most highly recruited players in the country. But he thought at Tennessee that, you know, he had an opportunity to play right away. He loved the coaching staff. Again, it was in the SEC, which was the premier conference. And it wasn't that far from New York. And he says that, you know, his parents, especially my grandmother, was was very happy about that. You know, she didn't want him to go too far. And so Tennessee is, is pretty close, especially East Tennessee, it's pretty close to New York. So for all those reasons, you know, he, he went down south to Knoxville. I want to hear your favorite Bernard King story. And if anyone hasn't checked in, I don't know if it's Bernie and Ernie or Bernie and Bernie on 30 of 30 uh, ESPN. There's a whole documentary on it and how close they are and how they played in Tennessee together. And then eventually they were reunited on the Knicks. Um, but, you know, with the relationship, um, your dad talking about Bernard King, what was a favorite story from, from your standpoint? Yeah. So, you know, Bernard is from Brooklyn and my dad and Bernard is a black man from Brooklyn, New York. My dad's the white immigrant son of Holocaust survivors from Queens, New York. They're a year apart. So my dad's a year older. They went down to Knoxville and they're one of the greatest duos in college basketball history. So they each average more than 25 points per game one year, right? So really legendary. The documentary is called Bernie and Ernie. Okay. A lot of people will call, it was called, it was called the Ernie and Bernie show. That's what they called it in Knoxville, right? Because my dad was there first. He was older. They called it the Ernie and Bernie show. You hear people today call it the Bernie and Ernie show because Bernard became such an amazing NBA player. I mean, he led the league in scoring. He's an NBA Hall of Famer. They were both great college players. My dad was a serviceable NBA player, but Bernard was great. And so, and like you said, they played for the Knicks, you know, with each other. And so Bernard, I call him Uncle B. I talked to him a few weeks ago. You know, he texted me a few weeks ago. He lived up the street from us. So I grew up, you know, knowing about Ernie and Bernie, being with Bernard. You know, my dad tells a great, my dad tells so many great stories about Bernard. And, 
if you ever want to hear, I was going to say an athlete, but really just anyone talk about someone else in their field with reverence. You should listen to my dad talk about Bernard. Like it's really cool to hear someone appreciate greatness. And my dad just appreciates Bernard's greatness so much, but he tells a funny story that when they were playing together with the Knicks and Hubie Brown was the coach, you know, Bernard got hurt and uh, just a minor injury. And a few people, a few of the players got a little bit more opportunity and they played well. You know, and then when Bernard came back, those players wanted more opportunity and they had a team meeting about it, you know, and and uh, it's funny to hear my dad tell this story because you know, he said Bernard was a quiet guy, very respectful, great team player. He didn't really speak up that much. But during this meeting about like guys trying to figure out how do I get more opportunities and the coach was there, Bernard said he kind of interrupted. He said, Hubie, you know, who's the coach? Don't run one play for me this game. OK, he says, if it's the last two minutes, I want the ball every time but don't run a single play for me. Cause I want, you know, I want everyone to, to feel incorporated. Don't run a play for me. <laughs> it's funny to hear my dad say, cause my dad says, you know how many points he had? So how many? He goes 43. <laughs> so wow. it, it just kind of shows like the greatness, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's a part, um, one of my favorite parts of that documentary, um, the Bernie and Ernie is where Bernard King talks about your dad and there was one game like he I guess always had his game face he was really mm -hmm. intense and there was one game where just subtly like he it seemed like he was it wasn't ha didn't have the same intensity and your dad just said a few words to him like hey get up I forgot what it was you know what I'm saying he's like hey get up yeah. for this one and and your dad just they just seemed to to have you know each other's chemistry oh uh, and it's really it's really great because they were two of the best high school players and uh, college players in the country playing together, each averaging more than 25, right? It's incredible. Rarely do you see two great players who actually make each other better. So I think that's what was so special about them. And then they had this amazing backstory of both being from New York and overcoming challenges in their own lives. So for all those reasons, it was just a phenomenon. But yet yeah, Bernard will say like, me, you know, Ernie and I had the best chemistry of any player I ever played for. And, you know, to, to what you said about my dad kind of pepping him up and saying, come on, B. Uh, my dad will tell stories about that too. And, and Bernard was legendary for that, where he would, he would psych himself up so much that he'd be sitting at his locker dripping sweat. That, that was the mental kind of preparation that Bernard would go through. And so when we talk about sports, life, business, right, that's all applicable, right? How you approach your, approach your craft, what you put into it. Mm -hmm. I want to hear a lesson that you learned from your dad professionally because he was, you know, GM for many years and also in sports. And um, I don't know your favorite sports moment from all the interviews you, you did with your dad. I, I have a personal favorite from the book, but what, what sticks out to you is when you hear your dad talk about his career, what sticks out to you? Two, two kind of pieces of advice, or, or, but they're not even advice. They're just things that my dad has always said to me. And this, this is highlighted in the book for sure. One is just, and my grandfather told this to him, if you work hard, good things will happen, which my dad would always say that to me. Cause I, as you know, from the book, right. I'm very honest in the book. Like I was an analytical thinker as a kid. And like, I dealt with my challenges, you know, trying to settle into you know, my, my path with basketball. And sometimes I could overcomplicate things and he would boil it down to the simple part work, just, you know, just work. And so not only is it a commentary on like, hey, you have to work, but it's also like, don't let the other stuff bother you too much. Just you know, work hard and good things will happen. And the other thing I've heard my dad say so much throughout my life is take the high road. You know, care like who you are as a person, your integrity, how you handle yourself. Nothing's more important than that. So you know, just just take the high road, treat people the right way, be a good person. Above all else, like you could score 25 points in a basketball game, you could be a really good student, like that stuff doesn't really matter in comparison to the type of person you are. And so those are things that, that I always uh, definitely have taken from him. And so my favorite sports moment in the book is when my dad wins a gold medal, um, you know, because listen, he, he came to uh, you. I did, we just talked about his background coming to New York city, not speaking English, not playing basketball, roughly 10 years later, standing on top of the podium as a gold medalist for the United States. Right. That's, that's why, you know, my subtitle says an unprecedented American dream. You know, it's, it, it's incredible. And my grandparents, they closed their store for two weeks, drove from, from Queens to Montreal and got to watch, you know, their youngest son become a gold medalist, you know, after them having survived the Holocaust. So it's, it's really a special moment. Okay.
That that was exactly my favorite part. And uh, <laughs> just to just to give people a glimpse, who are some of the players on that team? Because there were a lot of people that did not make that team, that that Olympic USA team. Yeah, there were there were a lot, and I write in the book as you know, a lot of great players who got cut. Actually, Bernard King being one of them. Where my dad was just still to this day, you know, because Bernard was one of the best players in the country. Uh, players like Hall of Famers like Jack Sigma, you know, Cedric Maxwell was the the finals of MVP of the NBA finals, just a lot of really Otis Birdsong, a lot of great players, but my dad's Olympic team, you know, Mitch Kupchak, Phil Ford, uh, got, you know, they were from the university of North Carolina, Adrian Dantley, Scott May, you know, that was back of course when college players were playing in the Olympics. And so it was a little bit of, of a different cast of characters. And my dad was a role player on that team. You know, he went, he was averaging 25 a game in college. He averaged like three, four points per game, but you know, he stood on that podium and put the gold medal around his neck and he, you know, did what he could to help the team. What about uh, a GM story? You you grew up around the NBA, right? In mm-hmm. New York and then Milwaukee. What sticks out to you as uh, a story from the, the business side of basketball? Wow. I mean, yeah. So my dad was an NBA general manager for 30 years. So I grew up in and around Madison Square Garden. I remember sitting on the back steps of my house when my dad and Pat Riley were sitting on my kitchen table you know, for the Knicks talking about trades and, you know, that kind of stuff is just, just incredible experiences, things I'll never forget. And of course, m- my life, you know, being able to go to playoff games and being able to go to practice and be around the players, not only get to know them and meet them, but learn from them. You know, that's, it informed my career so much. I love to hear some of the either uh, some lessons or knowledge imparted by you from some of these people. I know at one point, um, Rick Pitino was talking to yeah. you. So what did uh, he uh, said something to you as well? Rick Pitino and my dad worked together for the Knicks, right? After my dad retired as a player, he was a broadcaster, assistant coach, and all the way up to president and GM of the team. So Rick and my dad have known each other for a long time. Rick's known my family for a long time. When I went to Stanford to play, you know, and, uh, which was my dream school, as you know, I wanted to go there since I was in seventh grade because a uh, big reason is because my grandmother lives close to campus. I um, mean, she came to every single home game I played, but, you know, I, I struggled at first trying to find my way. And finally, my junior year, I found my rhythm and I was one of the top players in the country in my position. And we played Louisville and Rick Pitino was a head coach. And this was right. This is the beginning of the year. And the prior year, my team at Stanford was the number one team in the country, but I had a terrible personal year. I just couldn't get it together. But, you know, I think this Louisville game might have been my third or fourth game of the season. And I was averaging like 20 points and eight and a half rebounds. Right? It was like I was doing I was just I had come out of nowhere and was shocking people. And I actually didn't have a good game against Louisville, but that's beside the point. But after the game, when we were shaking hands, they beat us. Rick Pitino kind of brought me in for a hug. And in my ear, he said, Danny, I, I've never seen someone play as much like his dad as you play like yours. You know, and, and I write in the book like that was like, it was like an ascension for me, you know, because I look up to my dad so much, wanted to be a great player like him and, and, you know, struggled to find my way. But when I did, and to have someone like Rick Pitino tell me, like, you play like your dad, like, I was like, I'll take it. You know, that's that's all I needed to hear. What about any lessons or, you know, you mentioned that you've, you know, you'd be shooting around with like Patrick Ewing and John Starks, any uh, player conversations that you had when you were a kid that they, uh, gave you any lessons or imparted any knowledge on you? Guys definitely gave me pointers over the years. Even as I got into high school, my dad was the Bucks. Guys like Ray Allen, who, by the way, wrote the forward to my book, you know, Ray Allen's the top 75 player in NBA history. I remember talking to Ray before I made my college choice, you know, and, and you know, him telling me about his process of, you know, he went to UConn and I was, you know, really wanted to go to Stanford and just talking to to Ray about that stuff. But you know what, these guys modeled behavior for me in a lot of ways, you know, and I still just remember how what things they did. I remember going to Nick's practice when I was in eighth grade and Alan Houston, who, you know, is a friend to this day, you know, great, great NBA player, just playing one-on-one with me and just shooting around with me. And like, he didn't have to say anything, but the fact that like after practice, he spent 10 minutes with a kid just to like be a good guy. Like I always try when I was playing, I was never not only not nearly as good or as prominent as him, but, you know, if I was, you know, playing 
I was playing professionally and overseas. And if there was a little kid in our program, like spend a couple minutes with them because I was 12 years old then and I'm 38 years old now, but I still remember that. Right. And it, 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 it impacted me. And so I just took so much away from watching these guys, how they treated me, how they treat each other. I want you to talk about Ray Allen for a second, because I had to re-listen to the forward of the book. So I listened on Audible and I listened the first time. And I'm like, wait, I have to re Is he talking about Ray Allen? And I had to go back. I had to rewind it and re-listen to it again to make sure you were talking about the right person to make sure in my mind it was the right person. Yeah, it was the right person. And Ray wrote that, you know, and so people know what an amazing basketball player Ray was. But, you know, few people know that or at least not enough people know that. Ray has been this incredible advocate for Holocaust education, Holocaust remembrance. He saw Schindler's List in high school. He was moved by it. He said that this is not just a Jewish tragedy. This is a human tragedy. And so he made it his mission to educate people on the Holocaust. You know, every time he's t- his team played in D.C., he'd bring teammates to the museum. He's been to Auschwitz. You know, and so and, and again, I know Ray from my dad being the GM of the team when Ray was a young player. And, you know, we connected, you know, when the, the book was kind of coming to fruition. And he, an interesting thing is he didn't know my dad's background. And then you kind of get that from the book, Jeremy, right? Where my, this is not something my dad has talked about much publicly. And so, and Ray had been to our house and he said, Ernie, or er, both of Ernie's parents are survivors. All of his grandparents were killed in Auschwitz. Like Ray had no idea and he didn't hesitate. He, and that's why I tell people as much as I admired him and looked up to him when I was in high school, I look up to him even more now for the type of person he is. Uh, I want to talk about your career, your basketball career for a second in college and pro, but one person, again, another person that stuck out in this book um, was Frank. Okay. I want to meet this guy, Frank. I want to train with Frank. It made me want to train with Frank. Maybe be I'm, careful what you wish for. Exa- man. <laughs> exactly. Um, after hearing this, um, talk about your relationship with Frank and you just, you always had this kind of tenacity and grit uh, about you. So. Um, when you first started, when you met Frank and, and his impact on you? Yeah. So Frank was a very good friend of our families when I was growing up in New Jersey and he happened to move out to the Bay area when I got out to Stanford, you know? And so he, you know, I was out there, my grandma was close to not much family. So Frank would come to my games and just a good friend. And Frank trained people for the military and he's unorthodox. He's eccentric. And he would always tell me, you know, you need to work out with me. You need to see, you don't know what you could become. You need, and I was like, man, I was playing on the number one team in the country at Stanford. I was like, I got it, Frank. We're doing fine over here, you know? But uh, after I had this really poor sophomore season, I said, you know what? I need to make a change. And after, after one day working out with Frank during the spring to test it out, I said, well, this is what I need. Because to your point, I was tenacious. I was, you know, I was motivated and I could be pushed, you know, and no one pushed me like Frank. And so, we worked out together all day, every day, like three sessions a day for the summer between my sophomore year and my junior year. That's when I was the most improved player in the country in the history of Stanford's basketball program. And so Frank, and you know, in the book, we call him crazy Frank and rightfully so, but there's a method to his madness. And for as, <laughs> as eccentric and nutty as he is and how hard he pushed me, he always knew when to pull me back and I learned so much from him, you know, and one thing that Frank told me that always has stuck with me is that he, he'd always say, and he calls everyone, sir. Well, men, at least, you know, sir, sir. They say, sir, your mind will always give out before your body. You know, when you think you can't do more, that's you thinking it, you know, so you just need to, you need to figure out that voice in your head and how to kind of subdue that. And uh, that's true. I push like, just when I thought I couldn't push further, he found a way to, to push me, but he would also pull me back when I needed it. I feel like when I see this movie, Dan, Frank will be my favorite <laughs> character. I don't know. Why. We got to figure out who's going to play him, right? Because there's only one Frank, but uh, we'll figure that out. Someone really intense. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I know, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you've talked about when people ask you, what's your most memorable college basketball game of all time? You say the Arizona game, right? 100%. And I have a different one. For you. Okay. So yeah, I know like you got in the zone. It seemed like you taught, you'll tell the story where you stopped thinking and you just, just acted. But my favorite is the Washington state game. Okay. I don't know if you remember the Washington state game. Uh, I remember. And, um, I want to hear what you're thinking in that, 
those final minutes. And, and I, I may clip that into this. Um, sure. It's almost like a comeback story, like overlaying the career in this book, but I'll clip it into this interview. But what was your mentality? Just give people a little background of what, what I'm talking about, but what was your mentality going into the, the last like minute or so? Sure. So when I say the Arizona game, so this is my sophomore year when we, we were number two in the country at the time of the Arizona game. And my teammate hit this improbable 35 foot buzzer beater for us to beat Arizona. We were 20 and 0 at that point. We became the number one team in the country about a week later. Tiger Woods was sitting courtside. It was my birthday. Like it was the craziest thing ever. Right. And so, and we were having this Cinderella season. I mean, we were good. And, you know, our best player was the sixth pick in the draft after this season. Like, but we had him and a bunch of really solid role players and we were the number one team. So we just had this magical run. So that's when we, to get to 20, and 0. when we were 25, and 0, we were playing at Washington state, you know, in Pullman, which is a very hard place to play. They weren't the strongest team in the, in the conference, but they were up five against us with like 20 seconds left. And remember, as I said, I was having a terrible year. I had no confidence. I thought I deserved more opportunity. So I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't really perform, but I was in the game at the end and, you know, my point guard dribbled down. He kicked it to me in the corner. And you're down by three. four at this. Are you down by four? We're down by five. five. Five, right. So think about it. We're down by five with like 20 seconds left. So, to, if you know, ESPN now, they say like chances of chances of, uh, of winning, of losing. Like for us, it was probably like 98% chance of losing when you're down five with 20 seconds left. The ball kicked to me. I shot it. I shot a three. I made it, but I got fouled. So, okay. So, and then I made the free throw. So now we're down one. We force a turnover and my other teammate hits a shot at the buzzer. So now it's like, oh my God, like Stanford, like what's in the water? They, we win again. And, um, and it's funny that you say, what was I thinking? Nothing. And that's why I made the shot all year. That was my problem is that I thought too much and you can't perform. You know, my dad has always said to me, when you're thinking, you're stinking, you know, in basketball, that's true. Like you, and it's a joke, right? But it's true. Like you just, you cannot perform you don't perform basketball or anything like that with your head, right? You, and so at that moment, it was desperation because there wasn't even, you weren't even, we weren't even considering winning. We're just, you know, so I finally shot a shot with a little bit of, of freedom and, and carefree. And that's why I made it. Yeah. Fast forward to your, your pro career. What okay. sticks out to you as a favorite or memorable game in, in your pro career? you know, I won a championship in Spain and, you know, to, to win a championship is such a special thing. It really is like, that's what you work for. And, and it's just, it's, it's such a hard thing to do. And so, and my dad happened to be there. He was visiting, he was scouting in Spain and he took the train to watch the game. We won the championship. And like, I just like, you know, hugging your teammates, celebrating, like, it's the best thing about sports, you know? And so, yeah, that, that's something I'll never forget. And there was a, a point where you're, you're playing for Jerusalem, right? Yes. And it seemed like there was an emotional point when you, I guess, decided that this was it. This was your last, last game. I was playing. So I was in, I spent four years in Israel, two years in Herzliya, two years in Jerusalem. And my last year was in Herzliya. And pretty soon into the season, I was like, you know, I just have no more. I've I've nothing left, you know, nothing left to give. And you know, from the book, how intense the journey was not only wanted to be a basketball player like my dad, but, you know, I had loved ones who, or family, you know, they were the loved ones of my loved ones who didn't get a chance to live out their dreams. You know, they were taken too soon. And that, that intergenerational trauma is real, you know? And so I always put so much pressure on myself and, and wanted to succeed in basketball that it was such an intense journey. So by the end, I was really worn out and, you know, I, I, under a lot of stress and trying to come to terms with my career ending. And as you know, from the book, my career came down to the last possession of the last game where the results were still up in the air and there, you know, my team was in danger and I was so stressed about it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was just a wild journey. And I think it ended appropriately, you know, it, it ended, you know, there, it, there was not a moment's respite in, during my career up until the very end. I'd love to hear what you think, Dan, mentally, you know, you wrote um, some articles on kind of during the pandemic about, um, 
you know, your thought process of tough times, right? And, and it goes back to when I was, I actually interviewed Paul Bigum, who I mentioned that raised over a billion dollars for Israel. And those are for, from non, a lot of from non-Jewish organizations. And he would have to travel to these remote areas and interview these Holocaust survivors who are basically living in the woods, you know, really? in the cold and had not having anything to eat in their eighties. And, and he always, and I always think of that interview and thinking like, listen, if these mid eighties women don't have uh, heat in like below zero and don't have food, like who am I to complain? Right. Yeah. And so talk about your thought process of just the grit and perseverance. What do you think of when times are tough? Um, and you talk about a little bit in your article uh, relating the pandemic and comparing it. Yeah. And I think I write in that article, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And, you know, I definitely learned that from my grandmother, my grandparents and hope, positivity, you know, su such a such a big part of it. Um, you know, and just we, we all have challenges. There's always adversity and and everyone's challenges look different. You know, and I write in the book about this very bad injury that I suffered. And of course, nothing compares to the Holocaust with my grandparents went through. But we all have things in our our lives that are difficult. And so my life has been no different. And so just staying hopeful, staying positive, continuing to work, also leaning on your support system, right? Because we need those around us to lift us up and to be there for us. And so, you know, through all those things, and that's kind of how I think about, you know, perseverance and overcoming obstacles. And you bring, you know, the sports and what you overcame and what you did into the business world. So I love for you to talk a little bit about um, some things that lessons you learned from there that tr you've transferred over to, you know, venture capital and, and business. Absolutely. I, I didn't know at the time how transferable the skills are of an athlete to the business world, right? Because think about the life of an athlete. It's about communicating with people and, and listening and cooperating, making decisions under pressure, problem solving, leadership, as we just said, dealing with adversity. If you're an athlete, that you're you're dealing with adversity, right? Because there's there's just no other way about it. And so, yeah, for all those things I've have applied to my professional career and have been very powerful. You know, because I'm used to being in the weeds with people, being under a lot of pressure, working together, trying to figure things out, and ultimately, you want to succeed in business. Like that's what it takes. And you know, up to that point, your identity is a basketball player. So right. when you decided to retire from basketball, what were you thinking was next? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I mean, I, I love to learn. So I knew I wanted to go back to school. So I spent the last year I was playing, studying for my GMAT, you know, and so I knew I wanted to get a business degree. And I was hoping that by getting that degree, not only would it open up doors, but inside of me, I would learn more about what I kind of wanted to do next. And I was able to do that. You know, I, I went to Stanford again, got my MBA there joined a startup early, you know, which we grew, was able to transition to the venture capital side. And so, you know, a lot of things about what I like about the startup world come from what I liked about the sports world, which is it's competitive. You, you know, work is, is at a premium, you know, you can, you can try to outwork your competition. Uh, not saying that everything's in your control. And that's also like, like the sports world, right? A lot of it is out of your control, but yeah. And meeting different type of people cooperating with different type of, type of people. I just really enjoyed that. And so, yeah, my, my journey as an athlete, it's kind of now transitioned to my journey in the professional world. Dan, I have one last question. And before I ask it, I want to point people towards your website and anywhere where they can buy, uh, by the grace of the game. And I, one place you could check out all is dangrunfeld.com, which is D-A-N-G-R-U-N-F-E-L-D.com. Are there any other places online or on the web we should point people to check out by the grace of the game? I don't know yeah, if you have a well, copy you. handy, by the way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hold, yeah. So people can see it. There it is. By the grace of the game. Um, you know, so we're trying to support independent bookstores. We really care about that. I'm, I'm proud to say that the book is sold out, you know, which is a good problem to have. We're doing a kind of an emergency second printing because the book has really resonated. They have copies on Amazon. Uh, and so definitely available on Amazon, but uh, just in Kindle audiobook, like you said, just really grateful for people engaging more with this story. And uh, yeah, mean, means a, a lot to me. How'd you decide on Triumph Books? 
Yeah, Triumph is a great publisher out of Chicago. They specialize in sports titles and they they decided on me. You know, they really believed in me. They believed in the story. The acquiring editor actually had read the piece I wrote uh, about my grandmother, you know, in with the Hol- you know, surviving the Holocaust and linking that to kind of dealing with COVID when it first started. And so they believed in me. They they believed in the story. You know, we had conversations with other folks, we had some interest, but I, I saw f- some people and a firm who who really thought this could be something. And so, you know, I I, I appreciated that, went with them and uh, I'm proud of that. And, you know, again, the book you know, was a bestseller on Amazon. It sold out. So I hope that, uh, you know, we did them proud of it. They've certainly done me proud. So last question, Dan, and first of all, thank you um, for sharing these stories with everyone. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about last is your grandma on you. And just, again, we talked about just so much hardship there and on the other side of things, how close of a relationship you have and what sticks out as a, a bright light as far as your relationship together and some advice that she gave you. Listen, my, my grandmother is the brightest light. And, you know, and I actually say that about the story where there's a lot of darkness, but there's a, a lot more light, which there is, right? This is ultimately a hopeful, inspirational story. And it's really my, it's because of my grandmother, you know, and if she can overcome what she overcame and go through what she went through, there is hope for everyone. And, you know, she's, yeah, the, that, it, it's hard to put into words the kind of the impact she's had on me. I tried with my book, you know, but, yeah. but uh, it, it's I mean, incredible. She would and even I, go to all your games as well. Right? All of them. Cause I always, yeah, every, she went to every single home game I played at Sanford. And, she, and if she was on this call right now, she would interrupt me and say, and some road games too, which is true. She would go to Cal and USC, UCLA several times, but you know, I think from my grandma, it's just really about how you treat people, you know, being, being a good person, loving your family, you know, trying to do the right thing, having hope, uh, you know, even through the dark time. And she's the greatest example of that. We've talked a lot today about all the things she's been through and to, to be able to remain as positive and hopeful as she, she has, like she has inspired my dad so much. It was a big part of his basketball success. She's inspired me so much, big part of my success on and off the court. And I hope when people read the book, she'll inspire them as well. And I think she will. Yeah, there was one part of the book that um, that I feel like embodies that hope or positivity is when you were thinking about going to Germany and what she told you. Yeah, I read in the book, I'm probably the only professional basketball player who had to call grandmother to ask permission to sign his first professional contract, right? Because it was in Germany. And, uh, you know, when I asked her, she said, you, she said, go. And she said, sons are not responsible for the sins of their fathers, you know, which is an amazing show of perspective. And she said, you know, we can't blame this generation for what that generation did, you know, because that's what people have done to Jews throughout history. And that was part of the, you know, the impetus for the whole, you know, what happened. And so, you know, she just, in every phase of my life has been this amazing presence, you know, of wisdom of love of generosity. I want to tell everyone they should go to dangrunfeld.com, go to Amazon, check out By the Grace of the Game. It is a masterpiece. Get it, get it for a friend, get it for a family member. And Dan, you know, thank you so much. Jeremy, thanks for having me. This was great. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 